Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me? Yeah, I'm Dimitri Krampaliotis from Morristown Medical Center. I'm accommodating this session with uh, Bill Lombardi, who requires no introduction and an excellent panel. Just for the sake of time, we're going to start with the first talk. My good uh, friend and uh, prior fellow, um, Darson Dorsey from Mass General, is going to give us the year review in uh, literature. Thank you so much for having me here. These are my disclosures. So uh, in order to present the totality of the CTO-PCI literature over the past year in eight minutes is next impossible. Um, so I'm not even gonna try, but what I will do essentially is try to highlight studies that I think are practice changing, those that have some controversial uh, uh, results, and also highlight new devices, tips and tricks. So the first thing we're gonna start off with is probably one of the most controversial pieces of literature out there, which is the 2021 ACCHA Sky Guidelines. And these guidelines have now downgraded the indication for CTO-PCI from 2A to 2B. Most notably, it's the guidelines state that CTO-PCI should be done only for refractory angina symptoms on medical therapy and after treatment of all non-CTO lesions. Um, Stefan, I think, is going to be talking about whether or not the guidelines got it right. The second uh, big piece of literature over the past year is the global CTO algorithm. So as we know, there's a multitude of different algorithms used by different providers, so the, the thought was to create a cohesive global one, one that um, captured the essence of the North American hybrid algorithm, that of the Asia-Pacific algorithm, and then also of the European and uh, Latin um, algorithms as well. There are four notable changes compared to the hybrid algorithm. First, uh, the use of parallel wiring. Second, the use of IVIS as uh, upfront strategies. The third is the removal of ADR as a, as a primary upfront strategy and more as a bailout. Uh, fourth is the fact that there are criterion given for potentially stopping if you're not making progress. And the fifth is uh, stopping with an investment procedure. Now I'm gonna talk about a few randomized control trials. The first trial to talk about is the CTCTO trial, which was uh, uh, conducted in South Korea. 400 patients were randomized in a one-to-one -one fashion to pre-procedural CT compared to just angiography alone. And the outcome, which was a technical success, uh, what they found was that there was a 10% percent percentage increase in crossing the CTO if you used pre-procedural CT compared to angiography alone. And when you looked at it by JCTO scores, it really helped in those that had a JCTO score of two or higher. So it didn't really help if your JCTO score was low. Um, the use of CT, however, was not associated with any difference in heart outcomes. Uh, another registry to talk about, this is one of the longest followed registries. Um, in addition to the, uh, the Open CT on the Progress Registry, the Canadian Multicenter Registry published its 10-year results. And what they found is in a, around 1,600 patients that they followed for over 10 years, patients that underwent CTO revascularization versus those that didn't had a reduction in their all-cause mortality. And even if you underwent CTO revascularization by cabbage or PCI, you derived benefit. And if you also looked at the incidence of needing repeat revascularization or hospitalization for ACS, again, it was in favor of CTO revascularization. Uh, another randomized control trial, which was a little controversial, was the color trial. What it did was it randomized patients in a one-to-one -one fashion to either seven French transfemoral access or trans, uh, seven French transradial access. And they looked at outcomes of uh, bleeding academic research consortium, two, three, and five bleeding or vascular complications requiring intervention. Um, and they looked at only the primary randomized site. So if you did, if you required dual angiography and you used a second site, that was not used as part of the primary analysis. And what they found was that there was nearly six times the, um, the event rate using transfemoral access compared to transradial without an improvement in procedural success uh, with very little crossover. However, the devil's in the details. So if you actually look at how transfemoral access was done, less than 40% of patients actually underwent uh, ultrasound guidance for their access. And there's no mention of how many patients uh, actually had micropuncture access as well. Moreover, if you look at the MACE at 30 days, there seems to be a trend towards uh, worsen outcomes with transradial access compared to transfemoral access, with all the deaths being only in the transradial arm. 
Now, um, there's a, in juxtaposition to that study is the found blood CTL registry. And this was a registry of uh, uh, 200 patients that were randomized, not randomized, but underwent ultrasound guidance compared to angiography guidance for their access. And the primary endpoint was a composite of local hematoma, pseudoaneurysm, retroperitoneal bleed, AV fistula, and a hemoglobin drop of greater than three grams per deciliter. And what they found that the ultrasound guidance group obviously had a lower composite endpoint, but it was really driven by local hematoma, not the more concerning um, bleeding endpoints. But one thing to mention is that by using ultrasound guidance, uh, the, the patients had a two-day lower length of stay than if you use a fluoroscopy alone. Again, kind of harps against, uh, har kind of advocates for the fact that we should be using ultrasound guidance. Another study that I want to highlight is the Teleflex CTO study, which was used to try to get FDA indications for multiple Teleflex products. Um, this was led by, um, in part, by uh, Dr. Colin Pagliotis. And one of the things that was found in this trial is that it had amongst the highest technical success rates of any CTO trial. It was 95%, but the procedural success was about 20 percentage points lower. So procedural success was defined as technical success without MACE. And the main reason for that is this trial pre-mandated serial enzyme collection after the procedure. And as a result, a lot of non-clinical MIs were detected, which then dropped the, um, the procedural success rate. But it was not associated with any increased uh, rate of death. So when we think about um, how MIs should be characterized in our CTO trials and you know, all trials in general, um, given the controversy with the Excel trial and other trials, I think the endpoints for MI should be fairly uh, well established. And so this is a study that came out of FUY, where they had 2,600 patients that underwent CTO-PCI. Um, they had a mortality rate that was around 3.3%. And when they looked at procedural MIs uh, as characterized by troponin elevations versus CKMB elevations, they found that CKMB elevations, particularly greater than or equal to five times the upper limit of normal, was associated with mortality. Troponin was not. And then if you looked at four diff three different types of definitions, either the fourth universal definition uh, for MI, the academic research consortium second definition, and the SKY definition, the SKY definition was also the only one that was associated with five-year uh, cardiovascular death. So if we are going to be doing these trials, the definition of MI should really be CKMB greater than five times normal or the SKY definition. Now, one of the things with CTO-PCI is that you're obviously invariably going to fail. You're not going to be successful 100% of the time. But is there something worse than failing? And so this trial looked at patients that underwent optimal canalization, um, those that failed, and those that underwent stenting but had suboptimal results. Either you lost a significant side branch, um, your TIMI flow was one or two, or you had a residual stenosis that was greater than 30%. And they basically found that if you had suboptimal recanalization, you had a five-year cardiac death or MI rate that was higher than either of those arms, and uh, it was e economically worse. So this sort of points that if you're gonna do CTO-PCI, do it appropriately. If you don't think you're gonna get an optimal result, do not stent. Now, uh, shifting gears to the um, non-invasive space, so one of the potential benefits of CTO-PCI that's been espoused is the reduction in ischemic endpoints. And so Paul Knappen and his group basically did a PET study, and they found that the patients that had the greatest reduction in their perfusion defects, particularly if you were able to get their perfusion defects to zero, had the greatest survival from death in MI. And then if you looked at patients that had a hyperemic myocardial blood flow via PET that was completely normalized, they also had the highest uh, survival free of death NMI. So if you are going to do CTO-PCI, you want to try to take away as much of the ischemic territory as humanly possible. Um, this data was actually presented by one of our pri uh, in the, the prior talks, so I'm just going to bypass this. And then now I'm turning over to a few tips and tricks. So one of the most controversial topics or techniques in CTO-PCI is anti-grade uh, fenestration re-entry, AFR, um, which entails dilating a balloon in the subintimal space, creating fenestrations within the subintimal space, connecting to the true lumen, and then using a polymer jacketed wire to re-enter into the true lumen. So it usually requires two systems. So um, Galassi et al. have come up with a device essentially where the balloon as well as the wire 
can be done on the same uh, sort of system where a semi-compliant balloon is inflated in the subintimal space, which is on the R RX portion. And then there's an over-the-wire port where you can use your re-entry wire. This was published in CCI just last week. Um, and what they found was essentially that they had a 71% success rate for the case. They had 14 cases in this case study, as uh, case series, four of which were with primary upfront usage, 10 of which were with bailout for integrate failure. Another part that's fairly vexing for CTO PCI operators is when you are able to get into the true lumen of a bifurcation, but there's dissections in both vessels. So what's the best potential stenting strategy? So whatever bifurcation strategy you use, one of the issues is that you can close the bifurcation with a potential dissection flap. So um, uh, Jabbar et al. from Emory published the double barrel crush stenting technique. In this technique, you basically have wires down into the true lumen, albeit with uh, dissections in both uh, uh, limbs. And what you do is you have stents that are placed in both the side branch as well as the main branch. The side branch stent is bought back to the point where on IVIS, both wires are proximal, uh, are in the true lumen um, in the proximal portion of the vessel. Both stents are then inflated as a double barrel, essentially. And then what you do is you take a dual lumen microcatheter on the wire in the main branch and use a stiff angled wire. And then you enter through into the side branch, which you should be able to do because the side branch uh, was inflated um, and with a stent and is open. And you try to enter at the carina or one of the proximal struts. You can then take that out, do a kissing balloon inflation. Um, and then after you do the kissing balloon inflation, you're gonna pot. And that way you never lose access to the other side branch and the other side branch is stented. So again, in the interest of time, I'll stop here. What we need is a definitive RCT still uh, of hard endpoints. We still don't have that. Um, ischemia, CTO, and noble CTO are trials that are ongoing that hopefully will answer that. We obviously need continued innovation, both techniques and tools to make the procedure safer, quicker, faster. Um, we need to continue to figure out how to reduce mace rates and complication rates because we do know that CTO-PCI is associated with um, worse outcomes, at least in the short term, compared to conventional angioplasty and PCI. Um, and the other part is we need analysis around CTO-PCI training. So there's multiple ways to learn CTO-PCI, but are there ways that are superior to others? So I'll stop there and sort of take any questions and open this up for discussion. Since we have two minutes for discussion, Dars, so you know me, keep it simple. What's the one study that was the most impactful to you? Um, I, I guess the, the one study for me is essentially, I guess, the, the Canadian study, uh, their multi-center registry, which was a fairly large registry. It's one of the largest populations out to more than 10 years, and it basically showed a mortality benefit, and it showed that you can in, uh, reduce ACS in, uh, admissions, and so for me, it kind of proves that you know we may not be able to show hard differences in the short term for CTO PCI, but in the long term, we potentially do have real meaningful benefits that could affect outcomes. That's awesome. Thanks, Dr. So just so we keep us on time, our next speaker uh, is Stefan Rindfred from Emory, who's going to talk to us. Is CTO PCI only indicated for symptomatic improvement? Thank you very much. Um, to the and congratulations to the organizer for a great meeting. So to that question, um, so these are my disclosure to that question. Is CTOPC only indicated for symptom improvement? I would say no. Because the lack of evidence from randomized uh, trial doesn't mean that there's no other benefits, especially only well-designed and powered RCD uh, can uh, reject strong observational data. And actually, what is evidence-based medicine? What is it, what is it not? Right. This is like an old paper from 1996 by very, like, best esteemed epi epidemiologists. And what they would say is that good doctors use both individual clinical expertise, best available external evidence in making the decision. It's not a cookbook of medicine, and evidence-based medicine is not restric restricted to randomized trial and meta-analysis. So, and by the way, these are good doctors, an open CTO that did CTO-PCI, and you see symptom relief was the majority of cases, but there were other indications for which these doctors took the education, the educa educated decision to proceed with revascularization. 
Now I'll give you five other reasons to open CTOs. First, to reduce ischemia, improve tolerance for future events, improve LV function, improve outcomes in post-cabbage, and to improve survival. So to reduce ischemia, this is a good study where, uh, published a few years ago where they actually took 50 patients with severe lesions and 50% with CTOs. So, so the CTOs, they crossed, delivered an FFR, and they did FFR. So the FFR in the CTO lesions were low, was lower than in the severe lesions, so they're very low, and both benefit as much, so they were invariably ischemic. A very, go a very good study recently done by Peter Kajert from uh, Belgium, where they actually used IFR this time. And you can see IFR numbers that you never see, 0.33, and they largely normalized after CTO-PCI. So therefore, they're invariably ischemic. And why ischemia matter? There's a big study, uh, so uh, Darshan just uh, discussed a bit about it, but it's, uh, they, it's, a it's Paul Knappen and his group from Amsterdam, they look at the outcome of patients following CTO-PCI, whether they had residual uh, perfusion defect or not. And actually, if you could not reduce the, uh, the ischemia, their outcome was not as good as if you could reduce ischemia. So that has a very important um, uh, consequence. And if you, if you look at appropriate use criteria, actually, if you look at the, just the asymptomatic patient, it's rarely, like we used to say, inappropriate to do one vessel PCI, especially if you have intermediate, high risk, FFR is low, whatever. Most of the time, they'll say it's maybe appropriate to do it. Nobody, so that's the reason why I'm very concerned about those guidelines. I've never believed in guidelines. And I think in the end, those guidelines are fundamentally wrong. And as doctors, we have to use the best data. So to improve uh, tolerance to future events, you know that interdependence concept or double geoparty. If you have three coronaries and you and your one is dependent on the other, if you block this one, that's gonna be a problem. So we know that these patients when they have a CTO and they present with an AMI, they have a much higher mortality. That's been replicated in many studies. So this group from the Netherlands decided to say, we're gonna just try to prove this in a randomized trial. So they took the, the survivors in explore trial and they say, we're gonna open up their CTOs now that they've survived their STEMI, and we're gonna see if the EF at four months will be better with CTO PCI. Guess what, they didn't find any difference. So I would say that with a small sample and no evaluation of ischemia and that strange of hypothesis, I'm not that surprised that th you would have a negative trial, especially if you're big in the middle of the MI, post MI remodeling period. So I don't think that this clears the question of improving toler tolerance to future events, not at all. Can we improve LV function? Yes. Three big, uh, three, uh, uh, a big observational study from three large centers looked at the effect of, on LV uh, ejection fraction. When they looked at the patient who had low EF, 35 and, and, and lower, there were a 43% improvement in, in uh, LV EF in patient who had low EF to start. And this is a meta-analysis by, by Michael Megali and obviously uh, Manos where they looked at 34 observational studies. On average, when you do CTO-PCI, you'll gain uh, about 3.8 3 to 4 points of ejection fraction, whereas the, uh, the LV uh, systolic volume uh, will be decreased by 4 milliliters. There was a randomized trial done uh, by my friend Kambis Mashaiki where actually it was his objective was to try to find if CTO-PCI would improve regional motion uh, contraction, and it did not. And there was no difference if you would do non-CTO-PCI only or if you would fix the CTO, CTO over uh, doing al also the CTO-PCI in 184 patients with normal EF. So what it says, well, it's the limitation of that study is that the effect of CTO-PCI on regional motion is likely diluted when you're doing non-CTO patients because you improve the flow through collateral and it cannot be generalized to patients with low EF. So what we know with low EF remains what we've derived from observational studies. Can we improve patient post-cabbage? Of course. Prevalence of CTOs post-cabbage is up to 50%. Why is that? Cabbage costs CTO. And it's more prevalent when you have a severe stenosis. It's not about any progression of natural progression of disease. It's caused by the, uh, the, by the competitive flow in the artery. And we know that once the graph is down or, or failing, treating the native coronary disease will be much better than treating SVG. This is observational data, but it's 10,000 patients where we show that, the, where Manos showed that 
in HC and CDR that treating a native is better. So therefore, if you, just an example here. It's a non stem E65 euro post cabbage, Timmy2 flow in the PLV. I mean, it's not really a CTO case. It's like a slow flow in a PLV, but I have to deal with this CTO if I want to improve that PLV. We did the reverse cart and then the NADR and we reopened this and we restored, left that SVG on the PDA and now the right is filling the PLV. So where does it fit into it? Well, that's still CTO PCI, but I'm not doing it for, for quality of life. It, I'm doing it for our event. He's having a non stemi and that's the cause. Here, if you look at actually in the appropriateness criteria and the IMA, the IMA is patent without, an, without significant disease and you've got either SVG or native disease, there's rarely a single uh, case where it's rarely appropriate. Most of the time what you'll be doing will be either moderately appropriate or clearly appropriate. What about improving survival? I want to remind you that non-CTO-PCI does not improve survival. However, in, in uh, the most recent meta-analysis and all the ones we've done so far, there's a consistent reduction in mortality. It's not even like, it's not even heterogeneous. It's 48% reduction in mortality. Look at MI. MI, it's all over the place. I don't believe that opening a CTO reduce MI because it's already closed. But opening a CTO can reduce your mortality. So decision CTO has been talked a lot, a randomized patient to CTO PCI or not. Primary endpoint was a composite because you need to do a smaller trial. So you composite death, MI, stroke, any revast. So therefore you dilute the real important endpoints. He ended up randomizing two thirds of the sample side and they had a high crossover. He didn't find any difference. The study showed similar rates of uh, death MI, but if you look, the devil's in the detail. Look at the cardiac mortality, 1.9 versus 3.4. This is a 44% reduction in mortality, exactly like in the, in the meta-analysis of ob observational data. When you look at periprocedural MI, that's what's driving a bit more with CTO-PCI. Funny enough, stroke does not s seem to be caused more by CTO-PCI. At least it's, it's, not, it's, it's numerically lower. So what is this effect on mortality in that trial? Is it a better error, which is insufficient power? Well, probably, because the long-term mortality was 1.9 with complete revascularization and 3.5 with non-CTO-PCI only. This 44% reduction in mortality is exactly the same as in the observational data. If you would use, you would like to do a trial power to detect such a large effect, because it's a large effect, 44% uh, relative reduction, you would require 3,000 patients. Let's say you're more modest, because when you design a trial, you always say, I'm gonna reduce my events by 30%, okay? Well, we raised to 8,000 patients. Well, Decision City took six years to recruit one-tenth of that sample. So looking important, if you're gonna have a, a, a confirmation that CTO can reduce mortality, we'll never have that from a randomized trial. In that, uh, in that very nice study, uh, study done by Brad Strauss from the long-term Canadian CTO registry, look at the mortality. It's driven by PCI of the CTO or cabbage of the CTO. So there's a consistent message, revascularization. So if you do cabbage to non-CTO only or PCI to non-CTO, you do the same as a medical therapy. It's only if you get CTO revascularized, either with cabbage or PCI, then you get the, 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 the impact on mortality. So in my, my conclusion is that strong observational data support the benefits of CTO PCI on top of improvements of symptoms. There are two small randomized uh, studies that did not address the real question and the best observational data prevail as best evidence to inform medical decision. So in conclusion, opening CTO reduces ischemia because collateral cannot, uh, cannot provide sufficient flow during stress. Although CTO don't cause MI, the presence of CTO decreases tolerance to future events. CTO PCI can improve global LV function if your, your EF is too low, is, is, is low. CTO PCI is a necessary alternative to SVG PCR redo cabbage. If you say that we don't need CTO PCI, well, there's a lot of post cabbage that will have a, a hard time. And CTO, uh, CTO PCI may be the only uh, non STEMI uh, indication or lesion subset where PCI improves survival. So data on mortality from RCT will probably always lack. 
And uh, the best evidence med medicine to date is from numerous observational study. And I would say that the lack of randomized trial does not mean that we have lack of evidence or biological plausibility. So thank you very much for your attention. That was a, an excellent presentation. Uh, and Stefan, uh, you were very clear that you don't believe uh, in guidelines. However, I want to open it uh, to the panel and get some opinions. Uh, did your practice change or your thinking about opening CTO, PCO, or evaluating patients after the recent, uh, recently update, uh, updated uh, guidelines? Anybody from the table or even two? Actually, no, the answer is no. I mean, these patients came to us for symptomatic relief. They have several different symptoms, fatigue, dyspnea, angina. They need uh, answers. They want to improve their quality of life. So, you know, I agree with Stefan, particularly these latest guidelines do not give the right message to us and to the patient. And I think we should uh, do better studies perhaps in the future, but for sure we should not stop providing symptomatic relief to the patient. And as Stefan also pointed out, there might be additional benefits, particularly on hard endpoints that unfortunately a randomized trial will never be able to prove, such as mortality. And uh, I think we should be uh, do better research in this field for sure, but uh, CTOPCI is the way to go for uh, improving uh, patient quality of life and uh, possibly other outcomes. Um, I would echo that. Um, it hasn't really changed my practice at, at all either. Um, uh, the main reason I do it is for symptom relief, but there are other reasons other than symptom relief where I'll, I'll, I'll uh, uh, go after and do a CTO. Um, I guess what I would say is that if you're going to do something like that and, and try to demonstrate that there's a mortality benefit, you have to be successful doing it. You can't fail, right? If you fail, you, we all know that the MACE is two to three times higher than if you just leave them alone. So you have to be successful doing it. But it hasn't changed my practice pattern at all. Can I, can I say something? Yes. Uh, Dimitri, it's, uh, it's Cal Swad. So um, I know. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> nice, to, nice to meet you. Uh, nice to meet you, uh, Dimitri. Very nice. So listen, uh, 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 the guidelines did not change our practice in your centers and in my centers. And probably our sample is skewed a little bit. But what what make like what the guidelines did, we can actually, the, the um, people who practice in the trenches every day are not in uh, UW or uh, uh, Morristown or these big centers, they they have to make decisions about the patient, and I, and I think the message is clear. If the patient is symptomatic, you have to do something about it, and if you don't, cannot do it in your center. But also, the guidelines now give ammunition. Well, if the patient is asymptomatic, normal EF, and does not have non-STEMI because of, uh, believe it or not, CTO c does cause non-STEMI, so, although people are uh, surprised, then you can actually wait and 38% and of the time, according to the CURSE trials, and hopefully the ischemia trial will show that too, that at the end of the day, the patient need the artery open because of events down the road. And don't forget, um, we still prevented spontaneous MI after in the ischemia trial, right? We did not, like, it, it was the washout for the MI because the procedure caused pre-procedure MI. So the guidelines, I'm, I'm not going to bash the guidelines that much, but the guidelines is, is based on available data, and available data based on available interventional cardiologists, and available interventional cardiologists do not really do a good job uh, performing complete revascularization and trash in, trash out. I'd like to hear the tutorial. I, I'll make it simple. The only place you see guidelines used are in the courtroom. So in the courtroom, 40% yeah. of class one indication guideline indicated anything, whether it's beta blockers and heart failure, statins post to MI, pick whatever you want, don't get done. It's not people in the trenches, we just don't do a very good job. And most of it's because people don't respect the guidelines because we have a bunch of people praying at the double blind randomized placebo controlled trial, which is great for drugs, but not for procedures. You, know, you can't, I, I, you can't I, do a trial of something you can't do. Yeah, no, I and think, oh, sorry. Uh, just to complete the thought, the guidelines aren't validated. They're retrospective analysis of data that's been done. The appropriate use criteria have been validated. And it shows that if you follow the AUC, 
If you do a PCI or a surgery in someone rarely appropriate, it causes harm. If you do not do PCI or cabbage in someone who is uncertain or is appropriate, then you also cause harm. So I would just say is if you're going to cath someone, make sure they have an uncertain appropriate indication. If they do and you don't fix it, it's not an indication problem. It's a you problem because you aren't good enough to manage the lesions. And that's okay. It just means you need to figure out how to get better at your job to do what the patient needs. You know, I would, uh, I would echo what you said. You know, we, I think what you have also to do is to document. I had like a case recently referred to me, 50 year old with an LED CTO. The guy is barely symptomatic, but he's referred from the general cardiologist saying he's got a huge area of ischemia. And he's 50 and uh, I don't, I think we're, we're gonna send this guy either for an IMA or a CTO PCI. And I said like, the guy was not happy with the idea of having an artery blocked and everything. And I, uh, and I clearly documented in the, in the note that although the randomized trial are lacking, there's observational data to show that it might be a better option and we all agreed together with the patient and the treating physician that it would be the best way to do it. And he accepts the risk and everything that would be higher on the short term and maybe uh, so to pay maybe a higher price for a, longer, uh, 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 a higher longevity. So I think there's a way to get to, to still support your thinking in a chart the right way, but you have to document, you have to write. You have to, it, so that's what I've learned in Canada and I'm still using it here. All right, thank you. To keep us on time, our next speaker, Ashish, are you hiding in here somewhere? Manos looks like Ashish. Ashish is Manos? Excellent, we'll get it, we're gonna get an upgrade here. Uh, Ashish, so, so you so lost, you lost uh, weight. CTO PCI is bad, actually cricket is worse because Ashish got cricket accident and apparently he's broke his nose and cannot be here with us today. Or, or so we're sorry, feel bad for him. He broke his nose playing cricket. So please don't play cricket, okay? At least before this meeting, after the meeting you can, but before don't. <laughs> that will come with the faculty instructions for next year. But in any case, so, I guess you were stuck with me. So uh, this was Assis's talk, which was about CTO crossing algorithms. Here we reached an agreement. And uh, this is something you already heard from people. And as you know, we do have new nomenclature now with a CTR document. We call them extra plaque, not subintimal anymore. And we do have four ways to cross a lesion. There are two undergrade, undergrade wiring, undergrade sexual reentry, and the same thing for the retrograde wiring and retrograde sexual reentry. And the more complex the lesion, the more likely you are to need the retrograde and ADR than if you have the simpler ones, but at the same time, there's always this caveat that the more advanced techniques you use, like ADR and retrograde, then the risk goes up, which again might be because of the technique or because what you are using it on is a much higher subgroup risk to start with. So this was the first algorithm, a lot of people the panel um, created this, and that was the hybrid algorithm trying to uh, put some order on how you approach CTO, starting with dual injections, and then based on the analysis of the angiogram, deciding undergrade, retrograde, and of course, having the change, which is one of the mainstays. This uh, evolved later on, there was the um, Asia Pacific, which is very similar, adds the parallel wiring, uh, the IVUS guiding cups as uh, puncture of the proximal cap, and very similar for the Euro CTO club as well, that um, I know essentially the, the basic tenets are the same. So based on this, there was an effort um, um, a couple of years ago to try to merge all of them into one algorithm that can uh, kind of be globally accepted as a, f a blueprint, having of course difficult uh, differences in the local uh, parts. And this is the so-called global CTO crossing algorithm. It's in Jack, and uh, this is a summary. These are 10 steps that I think do have a kind of broad appeal. So what's the first uh, two steps? The first two steps are dual injection and a careful review of the angiogram. Dual injection remains one of the most underused tools for CTO PCI, especially at non-CTO centers. I'll be amazed how often you see films from people who do CTO PCI without dual injection, but that's critical for the success and the safety of the procedure. Donor vessel first, wait a couple seconds to the second vessel. Again, simple, simplest way to increase your success, decrease your complication rate. Then after you do this injection, you have to look at it. And look at it is not just like a quick glance, but actually spend enough time 10, 15, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, as long as you can, because again, what you see early on is different than what you understand the more you look into this. And you look at this in a structural way where the lesion starts, the proximal cap, the occlusion length, the distal vessel, and the various collaterals. 
You can use various scores like the JCTO, which is the most commonly used, which actually give you a sense, especially early on, on how difficult this lesion might be and help you avoid getting these very complex lesions early on on your cath lab schedule where your chance of success are fairly low. Progress CTO score along the same lines as well. You want to start with the simpler lesions and then go to the more complex later on once you're more experienced. Many people now use more coronary CTA, and I think CTA has actually have, is having an impact, especially for more complex lesions. If you can see very well the distal vessel, CTA can be very useful. Actually, in a study, it was more accurate in predicting success than the angiogram uh, itself. Example of easy lesion, nice tapered cap, soft, no calcium. Another disaster here where you have a very long occlusion length, calcification throughout side branches or cap. This was uh, a failed case. Moving on, what is the first thing you look uh, after the angiogram is the proximal cap. Do you understand where the CTO starts or not? And if you don't, there are different ways to, as we say, resolve the ambiguity, which are the retrograde approach, use IBUS guidance, or use the, the sexual reentry, move the cap techniques. So these are summarized here. Sometimes uh, you may not be able to resolve the ambiguity, you go retrograde. But quite often, if you look at the angiogram in a more detailed way, if you do an IVUS on a side branch next to the proximal cap, or if you use the move the cap techniques, you may be able to resolve the problem and cross to the lesion. This is an example of the RCA CTO. There's a side branch at the proximal cap. It's really hard to know where the lesion actually starts. And then you have to find your way, use different techniques to figure it out. The next thing you focus on is the distal vessel. Do you have a good quality, meaning a large, distal vessel free of significant diffuse disease. If you have that, that makes your life easier. And then uh, the fifth uh, parameter here is whether you have the so-called retrograde crossing option. We used to say, do you have interventional collaterals, but the bypass grafts are not really a collateral. So just for terminology purposes, the term uh, retrograde crossing option um, became uh, available. The bypasses and the septals are the preferred ones. Epicardia are a little more complex, but can be done in several cases by experienced operators as well. Step number six is undergrade wiring. So if you have no ambiguity, you have nice big distal vessel, then you're going to start with undergrade approach. And undergrade wiring is the most commonly used and the staple of CTO PCI. And actually success has been going up with new equipment, new wires and microcapitors. If it doesn't work, you have different undergrade crossing attempts. One is the pearl wiring, the other is the ADR. I know some people on the panel are allergic to pearl wiring, but we'll discuss this later on. Um, but again, these are options and depends on your experience. If, you're, um, you, know, if you have experience, this can work. Uh, Europeans, Asians do it. There can be longer procedures, something to be taken into account, but there are different ways to get this done properly. ADR has been traditionally what is done um, in the US uh, more commonly if you have sub or extra plaque wire position, with the Stingray being the, um, the main frame and uh, Stingray based reentry has been very useful. Moving on to the retrograde, as we say, there is uh, several steps for doing this. It is a powerful technique, although it does have some risk. The reality is many of the highly complex cases, this is often the only way to get it done. So if you want to be a high-end experienced operator, you have to have retrograde under your belt. Uh, and then be also able to deal with the potential complications. Systematic approach, step by step, can come a long way. Step number eight is to change the strategy. And that's something that you hear from everyone. I think everyone agrees on this. We used to try something for 20, 30, 40 minutes. Now a sign of experience is to know when to stop doing that. The faster you realize it's not going to work, the better it's going to be because you save radiation, you save contrast, and you increase, as a result, your chance of being successful and decrease your risk of complications. Uh, the initial approach, it's hard to see on the slide, but about 50 to 60% is successful. You need the second, third uh, type of crossing attempt to be able to get to the 85, 90% success. Number nine is an investment. Uh, that's an umbrella for different ways to um, approach a CTO. So another way, if you have an uh, inability to cross the lesion, you end up being extra plaque. What you can often do is uh, use the STAR technique, which is taking a polymer jacket wire, knuckle it all the way to the distal brand, restore undergrade flow, but don't put a stent, just let the patient recover, bring them back after two months, and then quite often, your wire is going to be much easier to advance to the distal true lumen and then be able to stand at that time. So a star, but a star without the stents, and then bring the patient back a couple of months. That works very well uh, for many lesions. And then finally, when do you stop? There are five reasons to stop. One is if the duration of the procedure is very long, 
three hours is kind of a cutoff if you haven't achieved much progress after this period of time. The other one is if you use too much radiation, with five gray being the usual cutoff. Third, if you use too much dye. Three times GFR, especially if you're having a patient with baseline uh, CKD. Fourth, if you have a complication, unless proceeding is going to help you deal with a complication. And fifth, if you've done everything you can think of and it hasn't worked, then you have to stop and try things that may not be safe or appropriate things to do. Uh, complications remain one of the things to be particularly careful in CTOPCI, which does carry increased risk of complications with other procedures. So doing this, you're going to be very careful, monitor the patient continually, look at the EKG, look at the pressure. So if something were to go wrong, you have a perforation, you have a dissection, then you can take care of it right away. So again, 10 steps, global CTO crossing algorithm, you can use it on Jack, and I think it gives you a framework. You don't have to follow the steps verbatim. This is a blueprint, gives you a way to think about CTOs, and the more experience you get, then the more often you're going to deviate from this. But again, that helps you create this mind of fra frame of mind that can help you be successful and safe in your procedures. Thank you so much. So, excellent, Manos. Uh, actually, I think the title of your talk is How We Finally Agreed on an Algorithm. And a lot of us have our names uh, on that paper from all over the world, but you go to several meetings and people still do whatever comes to their mind. So have we actually agreed on an algorithm or is it still the operator? Well, agreeing on an algorithm is one thing. Doing it is another thing. So I think the algorithm is kind of accepted, but I, I must tell you, in mean, most places, most people, and depending, I think it depends on the stress and the level of experience, right? I mean, some people deviate from the algorithm. And actually, the intent of the algorithm is not to be 100% conform conformity, right? The goal is not to have everyone do the same thing. The goal is to have a frame of mind. And you know, then you can, the more experienced you are, I think the more often you're going to deviate. Any other questions, Stefan? You know, when we, uh, we go to meetings and stuff, you see, I think the most, uh, the big variation in, in the practice around the world is the, the comfort in using uh, the extra plaque or subminimal space as a mode of treatment, either, you know, to, 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 to go for knuckles right away, to instead of uh, trying to stay in your plaque, to, to convert to star right away and bring back the patient. Everything, it's just, this is more Western uh, and North American big time. You'll see in Europe and in Asia, contemporary reverse card operators staying like two hours and trying to stick a, a, a one five balloon because they, they're, they are still caring for creating large dissections. And this thing has never been solved. So you will not get Asia Pacific to sort of accept that using the subanimal space or stenting the subanimal space leads to similar outcome. There's still a big resistance there. And I would like to, to hear what you think. You've, have you seen this? And how, how, what can we do to sort of slack this a bit and maybe come to a better agreement over time? Well, maybe I'll let other people ask this question. But I agree with you. I mean, the variation in practice is real. It is, I mean, we were meeting recently and it was undergrade wiring for like three hours. I mean, you know, there comes a point in life where, I mean, it's clearly not going to work and you have to move on. But the threshold for that, that, that component of change, I don't think has completely, um, uh, it's not on the mind of, people have a different threshold of wanting to change. So for me, if you're at eighth grade, I mean, you're done. I mean, you can, there's nothing you can do. I mean, you've, you've exceeded, it's a safety issue anymore. But in some, some countries, this may not quite be there for various reasons. And I would also add that, you know, now there's data. There were observational studies, National Registry, the British Registry, uh, Multicenter Registry that you and I, and others. And now also consistent uh, CTO, which was a prospective and rigorous uh, uh, single arm uh, trial. And also a German study, I think, from Munich that they did follow up on subintimal techniques versus uh, non subintimal, uh, like a true to true approach with OCT. The data is there. There are no differences in clinical endpoints. Still, many people are on the other side of the world are not convinced by that. So I don't know what else it takes at this point. Maybe we can ask Kate. I mean, you know, Kate is less biased on this. I mean, what are your, <laughs> what is your take on the variability versus following a specific algorithm? Yeah, I, mean, I think sort of watching this without a lot of skin in the game, skin in the game 
early on. I found that really confusing and that practice header journey at great meetings like CTO Summit where you see that, but it does seem like it's more of a faith-based argument at this point than a data one. So I think it's more of like what people are trained to do, what they're most comfortable with, and maybe being uncomfortable with the alternatives. You know, certainly, as you mentioned, experienced operators might try much harder with one strategy in a certain case because they think the retrograde option is very risky or something like that. So I think, um, you know, hopefully by continuing to do this, we can become more comfortable with each other's approaches because I think we can learn from that too. But it does seem like it's less of a data issue and more of a belief. And uh, we did a study back with Darshan and, and, and Song uh, when I was at Columbia, and we did both acute outcomes. And uh, the most important finding, which was consistent with uh, the British uh, data, is that there's no real time way of knowing exactly where you are. So essentially, you may think you're doing intraplaque wiring, but in the vast majority, in a good majority of cases, you are extraplaque, especially if you do retrograde wiring, then most of the time, by definition, you're going to be extraplaque. And the most interesting thing is that if you try to intentionally knuckle and get extra plaque in a significant number of cases, you stay within um, the, the plaque. The only difference, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Darshan, was we had a slightly higher incidence of periprocedural MIs due to uh, small uh, branches uh, occlusion. But after one year, there was no difference in the overall uh, outcome because we had a follow-up paper as well. So I, I still don't think why. I don't, I don't agree with you. I don't understand why people are so afraid of the submittable space. And you know what? The, the issue is that this is fundamental because that drives all the other decisions. Because the insistence of wanting to stay plaque and stay plaque will drive operators because you see the wire diverting into, into extra plaque submittable. And then right away in their mind is that the only way to solve this will be to go retrograde. Oh, we've got an epicardial, but we're able to do it and everything. So the whole thing is that this drives a lot of, I think, uh, behavior as operators that might not be the safest way to deal with, with the case. And that, that's something that needs to be sort of challenged at some point is that when you're, because you, or your insistence of staying intraplaque, does it justify you to go and take higher risk uh, approach. I think this is a very interesting discussion, probably the, the rooms thing is a more political event and we've got to stay on schedule. So the, Manos, thank you for sharing that. I think what you can see is maybe there's not as much consensus as we might all hope. Um, and with that, I'd love to learn more about Anagrade CTO crossing tips and tricks uh, from our colleague Jay Cotri from the Cleveland Clinic. Jay? Thank you so much. So the talk I'm going to uh, present is maybe to try to understand how a North American operator can adopt some of the principles that are being shared by this global crossing algorithm. And part of that is maybe being a little bit more comfortable with integrated wiring. And I'll share some tips that I've learned along the way. So the global algorithm, I think that the biggest shift would be this idea that from the original hybrid algorithm, there was a decision making point based on whether the lesion is 20 millimeters or longer. And, and that would help you decide whether you were gonna do ADR, the retrograde, or whether you could do integrate or not. But the argument could be made that maybe it's not 20 millimeters long. And you can use wires potentially to shorten that distance. And you can use IVIS to help shorten that distance. And you can use parallel wires to help shorten that distance. And that's what I hope to share with the audience today. I group wires for integrate into three categories. So there's intraplaque or extraplaque jacketed wires. So these wires are really meant to find the path of least resistance. You're not wiring anything. You're introducing these jacketed wires to the plaque, and then the wire is finding the path of least resistance. This may be intraplaque, this may be extraplaque. It's sort of irrelevant. It's finding the path of least resistance. That's its job. And then you have to move on from there, depending on how the wire responds. I put a bunch of different examples in the right column, only because there's a whole slew of wires that are available for this. There's taper wires, there's stiff wires, but they're all jacketed. They have no tactile feedback, and they find the path of least resistance. Some are designed to knuckle, some are not meant to knuckle. But the point is, they're slippery, and you can't feel. 
and they find the path of least resistance. Um, the second classification wire is the steerable wire. Now this is a wire that's meant to provide tactile feedback so that you can direct it. And the idea with these wires is generally you use your first wire to go wherever it's gonna go, and then you use the steerable wire to hopefully redirect away from where you've deflected off course. These have tactile feedback, and you can actually feel what the wire's doing in your fingertips. And so the wires that we use most commonly are the Gaia series wire. I think that they're very, very uh, useful for this purpose. And then the last wire is the penetration wire. And these are typically just to make a hole. And after that, you're done with these wires. You don't really use these wires for integrated wire escalation other than to make a hole, and it's often done in conjunction with IVIS guidance. So those are the three categories of wires. There's a bunch of different examples, and depending on where you work and your lab and what country you're in, you may have some wires that are available and others that are not. Uh, we have a lot of supply chain constraints because of uh, the current health issues, and so we kind of just pick whatever wire is available in these three categories. So this is an example of using a soft jacketed wire just to probe the cap. And you can see in the left panel, maybe a little overcommitted with a microcatheter. There's no tactile feedback with this wire, but you can see it buckling. That means that it's hitting something that it's never going to penetrate. Pull the microcatheter back a little bit and just reintroduce the wire, and it found the path of least resistance. Now, I don't care if this is luminal or not. In this case, it was luminal, but the whole point of this wire is to see if there is a path of least resistance. Is there, is there a microchannel? Can I get subintimal? Uh, it, it's sort of irrelevant, but there's no tactile feedback with it. All you're doing is looking at the fluoroscopic behavior of the wire, and then you move on to the next step. So this is an example of a uh, left main CTO that I did, uh, where the soft jacketed wire very quickly became extra plaque, and you can see that in the left panel that we have deflected off course. And that's fine. So people might panic here, but this is actually not a problem. Now you've identified the course of the left main, you know where the wire has deflected off course, now you take a steerable wire and just use it to drive away from where you've deflected off course. You can see in the right panel, we use the Gaia series wire to on purpose drive away from where we feel we veered off course with the jacket wire, and we very quickly re-enter the two limb and distally. So this is sort of an example of using that high tactile feedback steerable wire to correct the problem of the deflected soft wire. So what about a case like this? This is a patient who uh, had a complex circumflex CTO um, with no retrograde options and no really good uh, landing zone for an ADR. I really like to share this case because this was done by one of my fellows maybe a month before they graduated, and it wasn't done with me, it was done with a different attending. I'm showing you this just to point out that this can be learned very quickly, and I think it is something that is important to try to master as you do these cases where there may not be other options. So in this case, once again, we did the same thing. We take a jacketed wire, introduce it into the plaque, and we very quickly start spiraling around the vessel. But that's not the problem. The prob we've actually solved the ambiguity of the course of this vessel, because now we know exactly where the circumflex is. And if you look in the right panel, you can see where there is contrast to the left of that wire that spiraled around the circumflex. So now we know exactly where to put a steerable wire. So in the next set of slides, you'll see uh, my fellow took a Gaia 2 wire and on purpose is driving it towards the areas where we think that the jacket of wire is deflected off course. And you can see with just a little bit of patience, a little bit of redirection of this wire, he's very quickly able to re-enter the distal true lumen and uh, got a very nice result. But it took this understanding that the first wire, once it gets extra plaque, that's not a problem, that's not a, a complication, that's an opportunity to correct the crossing. Um, well, what about more complex cases? When do you use penetration wire? So this is a very complex proximal cap of an RCA. This is a case that, you know, you, it's really hard to know how to uh, access the proximal cap. And the only way you can do this is with IVIS guidance. And IVIS can tremendously improve the likelihood of puncturing intraplaque. And puncturing with a penetration wire intraplaque is the key to getting an integrated case done, whether it be an intra-plaque crossing or an extra-plaque crossing, the next step is to get a jacketed wire down the artery so that you can either re-enter by star or spontaneous re-entry or do a stingray re-entry, but you have to puncture intra-plaque to have this happen, and that's what the IVIS verifies. And so the next step was to take a jacketed wire. In this case, we took a jacketed uh, Mongo, which is designed to prolapse, and it was meant to set up an ADR case, but it 
spontaneously reentered and we finished this case without having to do anything. But what set this up was to intentionally use an IVIS guided puncture uh, to start the case out. What about cases of investment procedures? This is a patient that we tried integrated, retrograde, uh, could not get the case done, could not do ADR, brought them back after an investment procedure. And when we brought them back, patient had a persistent dissection flap from her investment. We used the IVIS, again, to identify where there may be some plaque to puncture, use that to direct a, a puncture wire into that plaque. And actually, once we put a jacket wire back in here, we were able to tr enter the true lumen distally without having to do anything too fancy. So don't forget about using IVIS to improve the likelihood of success of your integrated wiring. So in conclusion, I would tell you that soft jacketed wires are a great way to start a CTO because you may be surprised at how quickly a 20 plus millimeter CTO is nothing more than a two or three millimeter CTO just by introducing this jacketed wire into the path of least resistance. And there are very low complication rates by doing this. It's a great way to start in the beginning uh, when you're not uh, well versed with all the other crossing strategies. Um, I think that it's a good way to set up for more advanced crossing strategies as well. Um, and then the last thing I would want to share with you is that integrated wire isolation can be tremendously improved if you use IVIS guidance and the judicious application of more uh, specialized wires, particularly steerable wires and the penetration wires. That's a great talk. So, so Paul, this often comes up and listen to this talk, I think I get a sense, but should every case start with anti-grade wire? Unless it's a flush occluded right, um, I think every case should probably um, start with anti-grade wire. Okay. Jason? Uh, I would say uh, no, not necessarily. I think uh, oftentimes uh, having retrograde gear in uh, can help define the course of the vessel, which makes anti-grade uh, cap puncture uh, safer. Uh, and, and so I think if there's no uh, ambiguity on uh, the proximal cap, and you don't have a marked degree of tortuosity where you'd be really worried about the true vessel course. Um, those are cases where, yeah, I think it's very reasonable to start anti-grade first. But, but there's a, a fair number, probably you know, five to 10% of cases easily where you really wanna go uh, retrograde just to help define your course. How about you, Jay? You gave the talk. Do you think every case ought to start integrated? No, absolutely not. I think that uh, the whole idea here is how can you efficiently and reliably resolve ambiguity to, to cross safely? And sometimes you can do that integrated, but oftentimes there are situations where that's more complicated. It's actually easier to cross a septal and uh, get gear retrograde to have a target. It all depends. You have to, you have to be flexible. Was, this was coming up in a recent discussion, so I'll ask Dimitri. Which is safer, a Gaia 2 next antegrade or going through a septal retrograde? A septal retrograde. Lorenzo, what do you think? Well, it, it highly depends. I think in general, retrograde through septal is a safe approach, but still it can entail its own uh, uh, challenges. Uh, you know, it, one thing is that if integrally you need a Gaia uh, next third to just pierce the proximal cap and the occlusion is my, maybe 10 millimeter long. The other thing is the occlusion is 60 millimeter long. There is a lot of calcium tortuosity. So what's the purpose? Maybe you can pierce through the proximal cap and advance into a five millimeters, but then you're going to exit the, the, the vessel. So I think it's it needs to be uh, a personalized discussion in each case, but um, as long as the operator is facile with the retrograde techniques, uh, um, there's nothing wrong in going retrograde through a septal. Different stories with epicardios, of course. Okay. All right, that's a great talk. Appreciate it, Jay. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Uh, to keep us on time, I will introduce from Morristown, Dimitri Karpiliotis, the famous Gigi, who is one of the founding CTO operators in the country and certainly one of the experts. Thank you, Bill, and thanks uh, the organizers for uh, inviting me. Actually, a lot of the things that we talked about, integrate, retrograde, what's safer, will come up in, uh, in the case uh, that I'm going to show you. These are my disclosures. So pretty much this is a sketch that Bill uh, drew 14 years ago, but uh, it, nothing, not much has uh, changed since. And this is what happens uh, in retrograde and when you have to make a connection. You penetrate the proximal cap, you get in the subintimal space, you go retrograde, you penetrate the distal cap, you get into the subintimal space or extra plaque. As long as uh, this is not a mode of failure, this is an opportunity of success, as uh, I was uh, stated uh, before. 
And this is a transverse representation of the same uh, cartoon. In the middle, you see what's left of the true uh, lumen intraplug, and then you see, pick your choice, left or right is the anterograde and retrograde wire. They're on the same space around it by the, uh, by, uh, the, the adventitia. That's, what, that's the ideal uh, situation where you want to be in order to make uh, uh, the connection and complete your uh, retrograde um, case. So uh, some simple steps obtained bilateral guide access. This is mandatory. Perform dual injections in multiple views. Place anti-grade wire up to proximal cup of CTO. Retrograde wiring with long microcaster. Retrograde wire escalation to get where wire to the subintimal space near the proximal cup. The longer the CTO, the more likely is that you're going to end up using the subintimal space. Advanced anti-grade wire into the subintimal space with a knuckle. Anti-grade balloon advanced inside the subintimal space and inflated advanced retrograde wire into the true lumen of proximal um, uh, vessel. Then either snare or a, a wire directly into the guide. Advanced microcatheter into the anti-grade guide. Swap retrograde guide wire for an external externalization spe specialty guide wire like the RG3 or the R350. And then uh, perform routine PCI in an anti-grade fashion. I usually like to complete my cases um, uh, through the externalized because you have a lot of support. There are situations as the one that I'm going to show you that that was not possible, but also uh, the patient cannot tolerate it because of ischemia or a lot of tension uh, in, uh, in, in, uh, in the heart. The, uh, reasons for difficult reverse card, which is where we're going to focus. Uh, our talk is vessel tortuosity, uh, calcification, undersized anti-grade uh, balloons, uh, balloon dilatation not performed all the way back into the true lumen proximal. You really want to create uh, the whole tunnel back to the, uh, the uh, proximal uh, true uh, lumen. Knuckles have caused big hematomas. Uh, reverse car performed not in the optimal position, and I think this is something that we tend to realize more and more as we use intravascular ultrasound. You want to really try to make the connection at a safe spot, which is usually a straight part of the vessel, and also where your anti-grade and retrograde gear are closest to one another to avoid um, going into larger balloons with potential uh, increasing your risk of uh, perforation. And very similar undergrade and retrograde wires are not in the subintimal space, which is the optimal position to make uh, your uh, reverse card. And this is a recently published study in uh, uh, Euro Intervention from Colombia and Akiko and our team, where <coughs> you see the four patterns of undergrade, <coughs> excuse me, and retrograde wires. And just focus on the right. The most uh, difficult connection is you have the undergrade wire in the subintimal space and the uh, retrograde wire uh, intraplaque. This is a situation where uh, there was a need to redirect the wires and create different planes in order to make uh, the connection. I'm going to share with you, <coughs> excuse me, a case I did uh, recently, and uh, I hope that uh, you will find some uh, interesting uh, uh, points here because we had to do a lot of uh, problem uh, solving. So this is. <coughs> Uh, left uh, uh, shot, uh, and you see, to me, this is a very ambiguous uh, proximal uh, cap. Uh, I have no idea how tortuous the vessel is. There are a lot of bridging collaterals. There are a lot of branches there. Uh, back to the question, do we always start undergrade or retrograde? Plus, I had issues with guide support. Uh, even if these cases were not CTOs, these patients are vasculopaths, so he had a horrible aorta. A good trick here is to put even longer sheets than the 45 uh, in order to get better control of your guides and better support. <coughs> we have very good uh, <coughs> retrograde uh, options uh, here through uh, the septals. And here you see that we chose uh, the first uh, septal uh, this is usually the one I try uh, first. It was not difficult uh, to cross. You see that uh, this is uh, the wire is actually towards the posterolateral. It was very easy to advance the microcaster, which is th this case is a caravel, and it will become relevant uh, as the case uh, goes on. Uh, we had just to uh, uh, advance the microcaster and then rewire uh, into the um, true lumen uh, in the AV groove uh, RCA. 
uh, a trick that a technique that I use uh, more and more and think is underutilized uh, is uh, distal tip injection. It gives you better visualization and more details as to uh, the anatomy of the distal cap. You just have to be careful not to be subintimal because uh, it's not the end of the world, but you can actually extend it if you inject too powerful distally, and then that will be the end uh, of uh, your case. So this is something that I strongly recommend. Uh, you will save uh, yourself a lot of trouble. You see here branches that <coughs> you could not see with the dual uh, um, injections from the guides. And here is uh, the problem that I was talking to you about, problem solving uh, number one. Uh, the caravel crossed easily, but it gives you no, no support. So you get to a position where you're uh, at the distal cap, and then as you're trying to either penetrate or form a knuckle, then it, you have nothing, you have no support. So the solution to that is to just take it out, trap it, and then introduce something with a little bit bigger body. I think in this case it was an LP, if I was uh, not uh, mistaken. And this is uh, why L not every case should be started uh, anti-grade. Uh, I was really scared when I saw those knuckles uh, forming there. I like to make this kind of pseudo panoramic view to make sure that actually there is some dancing at the grade, the retrograde, but this was clearly unanticipated. Just imagine trying to get a stiff penetrating or even steerable wire and try to figure out this uh, proximal uh, vessel tortuosity. The other issue that you see here is that the knuckles are huge. So when, uh, where are you gonna make the connection and how? So proximal cap ambiguity, I use the scratch and go, penetrating wire. I like to get into the wall of the diseased artery, advance the wire a little bit, flip it up, advance the microcatheter into the subintimal space, and then you will see as we do, we do this, uh, I'm sorry, maybe here you see the knuckle forming anti-grade. Now we're in a much uh, stronger position. We obviously also have a wire uh, to um, increase uh, the guide support in, uh, in the conus branch. Again, you need to check in two projections, but the knuckle stays small, which is very important, which means it's in a confined space. And now we're ready to perform the reverse card. Now we need to start ballooning. Where are we gonna make the connection? Are we gonna make it in the um, very tortuous uh, segment there? I think trying, this is, I think, dangerous. You will need very large balloons. It's gonna be very difficult to steer the uh, uh, retrograde uh, penetrating wire. And it's, uh, I mean, you're looking for trouble. Uh, you're gonna spend a lot of time and you may end up with um, uh, a perforation. So, we decided uh, to start uh, ballooning and then get uh, a guide extension into a little bit more favorable part uh, of the vessel. You see it's, it's straighter. Try to make your connection in a straight part where the knuckles are small, no big hematomas, where the anti-grade and the retrograde wire um, are, uh, are closer to one another. Uh, it took us a while to make uh, uh, the connection, but we were finally able to get uh, our uh, retrograde wire into the anti-grade uh, guide extension. Next step is to advance into the guide and then remove uh, the, the wire that was a Gaia 3 that we used uh, to uh, make uh, the connection. And then we thought we were done, uh, but I don't know how many times you've seen that. I try to get the externalization wire you see here and after a while, due to the extreme tortuosity, it would n just not go. So we are in a case where we have crossed, we thought we were done, we have a guide extension down, and I cannot externalize uh, the wire. So we decided to use a tipping uh, technique, which I will show you here. It's actually much easier than it looks. It doesn't require too much skill. So essentially, you take an anti-grade wire, and you wire into the retrograde guide, And here you see that it takes the course uh, of the vessel. And then to make a long story short, then it's just a simple ballooning and uh, stenting. This is a distal stent. Yeah, the patient were, uh, was a Navy uh, yard uh, worker. 
because you had asbestos. And then it's just stenting. And I just want to show you here the degree of uh, the tortuosity uh, of, 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 uh, of the vessel. And this is uh, the final result. We didn't go for perfection. My fellow wanted, uh, man, not my fellow, Amir wanted to do an IBUS. I said, I'm done with uh, this case. It looks good. I'm not going to do anything more in that uh, horrible bend there. It was a 4-0 uh, stent. And obviously, at the end, always check the donor vessel to make sure that there's no injury. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dimitri. Uh, Kate, what's the, what, are, what are the things you struggle with retrograde? What are, what are a tip and trick, one of the common problems? I think one of the things I've definitely had to change over the last couple of years is moving that base of operations, as you referred to it, sooner that you get you know, sort of wedded to the idea that I've worked so hard to get my retrograde microcatheter up that the idea of coming back.